Well, that's, that's good. I was always interested in the ways people are. As a teenager, I was really eager to find out what the sort of default culture is of humans. Like what is our like, base level common culture that every human community has. Well, it turns out, spoiler alert, that there is no such thing as a default culture for humans, but that the common theme is that each culture creates their own values and traditions, their do's and don'ts and the social protocol. And to identify and work with those cultural and social aspects, that's really crucial when you want to create um, when you want to create a nice environment and work with any community. Whether it's a group of hunters and gatherers in the Paleolithic in the, during the last ice age, or a group of open source developers at a meetup or a hackathon in 2018. It's these aspects that you want to focus on when you aim to open, open up your community and your group to a more diverse range of people. When you want everyone to join in on your next mammoth hunt. So, welcome to my talk. <laughs> I'm Sonia. Thanks, Pilar, for the nice announcement. Um, if you want to tweet at me during this talk, I'm always uh, happy for uh, people to look at their phones and interact, because I love to read those tweets later. Tweet at me at Sonkiki. I'm uh, happy to see all of this later. And what I do, besides uh, practicing Krav Maga in my free time, <laughs> I'm a freelance communications consultant. That means I specialize in organizing tech events, for small businesses and NGOs, and I help my clients reach out to new audiences and make their more communities more inclusive and diverse. This is my typical work environment. Where is it? Oh no, that was too quick. One, got mi one is missing, is it though? Nope, yep. My current work environment is missing, but that's okay because you can easily imagine me at an event like this, doing what the organizers do. Um, I've organized and event managed a couple of hackathons. For example, the Wikimedia Hackathon last year. That was a large international conference for the developers, mostly volunteers, for the uh, software that powers Wikipedia. I also host and MC, as Pilar would call it, events doing what, well, the organizers do here too. Um, and I did that, for example, for the coding and tech initiative Jugendhakt. And I also, here at TU, I organized the Viscom Science Communication Hackathon that happened two years ago. So I basically, I'm at events, I talk to people, and I sit at my computer and write emails and outreach concepts. But 10 years ago, you already saw that, my work environment looked quite different. Oh man, yeah, that was it. Ten years ago, I was just about to finish my master's in archaeology, or pre and early history and medieval archaeology, to be exact, at the University of Vienna. I, well, what is archaeology? Let's begin with that, because you're probably thinking of dinosaurs, but that's not true. It's all about humans, because archaeology studies and excavates the remains of human material culture. So no dinosaurs involved. But mammoths are the cooler animals, though they're more fluffy and cuddly. So that's okay. The tip pictures at the top and bottom left show the excavation at Kremswachtberg in Lower Austria. It's a Paleolithic campsite, and I had the pleasure of working there. Among lots of flint tools and mammoth bones, this site brought forth three child burials that were like soon after their birth or they were stillborn, they were like carefully buried with a lot of grave goods uh, about 32,000 years ago. So that was one part of my work. I was also working as a guide at the Natural History Museum, Vienna, which you can see me doing in the uh, bottom right. I got the 
sides wrong. Well, in the picture with the kids, because it was there that I was presenting the findings of my field to a really diverse range of audiences, student kids, adults, all kinds of backgrounds, that I would, that I would explain what archaeology is all about too. And it was there that I discovered that I really like this part of being a link between people and getting different messages across. And so, over the course of the next couple of years, as you probably know as millennials, or in the age where millennials exist, work life is not so straightforward, there are many crossings and turns, and because I had this knack for communication, my career moved away from archaeology and more towards communication. But certain ways of looking at the world always stuck with me. And today, I'd like to share a few of those ways of looking at the world with you. Humans are a fairly com complicated species with an intricate web of cultural aspects. And we're gonna, in the first part, look at a few of those cultural aspects and a few examples. Those are far not all of them. We will start with a very personal piece of material culture, clothes and appearances. This includes dressing, jewelry, any body modification such as tattoos and piercings, but also makeup, hairstyles and other items of decorative value. In the context of the society, they can be clues about overall social and economic status of an individual. But they, they also show allegiance, allegiance and affiliation. Dressing alike is a neat way to establish group identity. We use clothes and appearances to show rank and achievement, as well as to express gender roles. But while those things are great first clues about the wearer, we got to be careful not to jump to conclusions, conclusions too quickly. So, imagine this, at an excavation, you find a grave like this with a skeleton in it, surrounded by grave goods. Which clues do you have about the individual? When a body has been dead and decayed for a while, like when it's a skeleton, like in this picture, you can analyze their bones to get clues about the individual's age and sex and other information such as were they really muscular because then the bones might look different than the bones of a like, more skinny individual. DNA sampling is not always possible with those ancient skeletons and it's also like for archaeology as a field a fairly recent method, this whole DNA thing. And you can also look at the grave goods to get clues about the individual's former life. The grave goods that they were buried with and the remains of their clothing which didn't rot away. For example, for me today, this would be like this, this robot pin, which could maybe already give you a little bit of a clue that I do something with tech or that I have like an, affili an affiliation for that or maybe games, who knows. So, and when you interpret that, when you interpret those grave goods to be clues for what the individual's life was about, behold the bias of the interpreter with a gender normative patriarchy weighing down heavily on over 200 years of archaeological practice. Because when burials are found with grave goods such as weapons and hard tools, the individual has a high chance to be interpreted as male right away, regardless of their biological features. This is how a Viking warrior woman was misinterpreted as male for over a century. This is a, grave, a chamber grave from Birka in Sweden that was excavated in the 1880s. And it contained, as you can maybe see a little bit, shields, an axe, a spear, a sword, a bow with a set of heavy arrows, the remains of two horses, and uh, a set of game pieces, strategical, like a strategical game, possibly for planning battle tactics. And even though the osteological analysis in the uh, like late 19th century already suggested that this is an, like a biologically female individual, the archaeologists then they just like push this 
those clues to the side and so like, well, this has to be a man because it's got swords and horses and an axe. But the uh, solution or the salvation for this uh, misinterpretation came last year when a Scandinavian scientist and her team finally managed to get enough DNA from the skeleton to analyze it and prove that indeed this individual was of the female sex. This is just one case that was recently uncovered and there's a lot more to this discussion and a lot more, and a lot more burials that were probably most likely misinterpreted. You don't always find a complete skeleton so this is a whole like other bag of worms. I'll tweet out, like after my talk, I'll tweet out a link to this, to, a, to an article that references this chamber grave, Guardian article, with also suggests further reading. So you can, if you want to get into that. But what do you take away from this for your tech communities? In the same way that archaeologists have to be careful not to judge a skeleton by its grave goods, you have to be careful, we all have to be careful not to jump to conclusions or assume certain qualities or the lack thereof because of the way people look and dress. We have to leave enough room in our heads for expression outside of our norms, gender and otherwise, to challenge our status quo and we're going to be rewarded with a richer and more diverse society. Technology and tools, that's how we classify prehistoric periods. The use of flint tools in the old stone age, polished stone tools and um, pottery in various shapes and sizes in the Neolithic or the new stone age. And then we have the bronze age and the iron age with their respective metals. In the iron age, technology really kicked off. And whatever technology has a boost, that also, or very often, correlates with the change in society. The iron that was mined during the Iron Age, hence the name, made it possible to produce better tools, harder tools, like a very much harder metal than bronze, and that made it possible to like, build more houses, mine even more iron, and that brought forth an increase in population and an increased productivity, and for that, there had to be a division of labor, which created a more ranked society, as certain professions in this division of labor gained higher ranks than others. This is a drawing from a graveyard in, that was found in Hallstatt, there, where there was a large salt mining town during the Iron Age. And People in that graveyard uh, can tell us, or like the, the findings of those graveyards, the bones and the grave goods, can give us a little bit of clues about the society and what their values were then. People who did a lot of hard labor, which I told you before, you can tell by the bones because they develop differently when there is a lot of muscles and use to the bones. They were buried with rich grave goods hinting at a high value of hard labor in that society. If you want to compare that to today's validation of hard labor in our workforce, maybe like salary-wise, that'll paint a different picture. Which skills does your tech community reward? Does it reward attention to detail, collaboration, innovation, boldness? To be accessible for a wide range of people, you, of course, want your community to reward a, like a wide range of skills to be accessible for all different kinds, of, different kinds of people and talents. And keep in mind that it's not the technology itself that defines what a useful skill is and what's not. It's the people that use the technology, your community, who give out the brownie points for what's a useful skill and a good role in that group. My favorite. <laughs> um, your symbols and expressed by symbols a shared story. Symbols are tricky for archaeologists because just knowing what an object looks like and what it's made of does not give you any clue about what it means to people or what it meant to people in that case. 
So I'm just going to leave this uncommented and move on to an archaeological example. A good example for a symbol is always the very well-known figurine of the so-called Venus of Willendorf. It's a figurine with female features carved out of limestone and it's just one of hundreds of lesser known similar figurines that, were, um, that date all back to the Paleolithic, certain time in a Paleolithic, between like 30 to 20,000 years ago. When this figurine was found, found in Lower Austria in 1908, the male archaeologists of that time interpreted her as a sex symbol shaped for the male gaze, something for like, like, a, like a prehistoric pinup or something. And that interpretation fit the image that the Europeans had of the Paleolithic society of hunters and gatherers, but it also fit the image that was of the contemporary, contemporary society at the beginning of the 20th century in Europe. The Paleolithic women had no agency in this interpretation, but the women at the beginning of the 20th century in Europe had limited agency either, for example, no right to vote in Austria at that time. Other interpretations for the Venus of Willendorf include a fertility symbol and a symbol for an ancestral religion. Which one is it? I cannot tell you. I prefer the, um, the interpretation of symbol for an ancestral religion, but I can't tell you whether that's correct or whether any of those interpretation is correct or what that even means, symbol of ancestral religion. You might just as well look at dank memes on Reddit. Okay, so what can you take away for your community from this? Symbols can be a great way of creating a shared identity because those people who know what the symbol means, they have a shared bond. I'm going to show you an example from the tech community Jugendhakt. It's like an open coding community that's happening in Germany, Austria and Switzerland. It's a network where young adults are empowered through their ability to create something with tech, to code and make the world a better place. When Jugendhakt was founded in 2013, this logo was always, that was always their logo, somewhat ambiguously designed animal. And as the community grew, as the culture of Jugendhakt grew, more and more discussions started happening about what actually is this logo, which kind of animal is it? And young participants would take, one young participant would take a, a plushie, like a plushie toy, to one Jugendhakt event because of another participant who couldn't attend. And she thought, yeah, well, this is, instead of that participant, I brought this alpaca plushie. Mm -hmm. And so discussions started happening whether this might be an alpaca, an animal that was also like, quite popular on in the internet that time. And this tweet that was sent out by the organizers comparing an alpaca face to the Jugendhakt logo, that really confirmed it. And now the symbol of the alpaca is really integrated to the whole Jugendhakt community. It's part of their story. The young participants bring all kinds of alpaca swag. People wear t-shirts, people make t-shirts with God alpaca on them. And one alpaca plushie has a Twitter account. They have customized alpaca emojis in the Slack channel and all sorts of things like that. That's a really great way of creating a shared story. So, those are a few things to digest over time. Maybe things that you wanna contemplate later, maybe things you want to tweet at me about, that's all fair. But what can you do right away for your hackathon or your developer meeting that you want to host maybe in the next month? Here's a few concrete measures that you can employ. This is a no-brainer but really, really important. Make women and diversity visible, literally, in actual, like, in actual images, photos, and a visual representation. That's a, that's a big key part. Think of the Viking warrior woman that I was talking about. When we uncritically project our current gender roles into the past, we're losing so much of the diversity and the complexity that the human social life has to offer. And why not show all of that complexity and all of the diversity? Archaeology has a long history and a bad habit 
of uh, making men the default humans and not to even recognize gender as a concept. And I think that's not just a problem that archaeology has, but that many sciences have, many aspects of our lives make men the default humans. And by that we're losing something. Learn from archaeology's mistakes, represent the people you want to reach out to, actually in your community, in your community structure, represent the diversity you're looking for. When you're working with volunteers, you do not necessarily have 100% influence over that because they're volunteers. You, can't, you can influence who like, openly wants to do your open source development. You do have, to a certain level, influence over that, but not directly. So also, make it a point to set realistic goals. If your community today is composed of 95% white men, that's okay, you won't change that in a year, but there are certain things you can do. Put women in places where you can influence it. Bring more women, transgender people, people of color, people with disabilities and other marginalized groups into your advisory board, into your staff, and make them mentors and role models. And you can partner up with organizations that represent the diversity that you're looking for if you yourself as an organization are not there yet. There are so many, especially in, in Vienna, but in many other cities and parts of the country as well, there's so many great organizations, NGOs, Vereine in German, like we heard a lot about the women in Vienna and other networks that really on a voluntary basis, where people do this in their free time, unpaid, they are passionate about diversity, they're passionate about like, different aspects of tech, partner up with them and you'll be stronger. A, a quick shout out to the Visible Wiki Women campaign here. This is a campaign that's currently running in March. It's organized by an NGO called Who's Knowledge, of which the co-founder is uh, represented here on my slide. This campaign m makes an effort to upload more images of women to Wikipedia to make them and their contributions visible. You, you're welcome to partake in that, just find it with the hashtag and I'll also tweet out a link to a detailed campaign description after my talk. So. Remember the Venus figurines that I was talking about earlier? I mean, I hope you do, it was like five minutes ago. So, <laughs> the archeologist who gave them the name Venus figurines, that was, by the way, a man, and he used this term as mockery to fat shame those quote-unquote primitive sculptures as opposed to like those well-proportioned beauties of the antiquity, like the Venus de Milo. And even though it was not like a correct name, it stuck around though. And apart from being an insult, it's been confusing people ever since because it adds to the, it adds a layer to the interpretation. People when I was working at the Natural History Museum and I would show them the Venus of Willendorf, people would think of, or kids would think of, ah, oh, is it named after the planet? Or is it named after the Roman goddess or the tennis goddess? Quick shout out to Venus Williams here. Who is a tennis fan? <laughs> well, this is an example that not everyone wants to go under the name that was given to them by birth. Some people, um, or like their Klarname in German, their birth name or Klarname. Not only, but especially for the transgender community, letting people to be represented, or giving people the opportunity or chance to be represented with their chosen name is such an easy way to give self-determination to your community. It doesn't, really doesn't cost you anything if you want to let people pick the name that they have on their conference badge and not force them to go with the name that's in their passport. And to some people, especially when you're in the tech and in the software development community, they prefer their online pseudonym or nickname anyways. When excavating, Archaeologists are often more excited about the features of a site than the actual removable artifacts that they find in this site or on this site. 
because how the space is laid out and where things are in relation to one another, that gives you a lot of clues about the society that was using that space. And so therefore, manage the heck out of your space. Really, it shapes how people feel. What's represented in your space directly feeds back to what's reflected in your community and vice versa. Here are a few, not a complete, complete list, but a few examples of how you can use, how you can shape your space. No-brainer, make it accessible for people with reduced mobility or like if you want to host the, the event at your place and it is not accessible for people with reduced mobility, you may want to rent out another space, even if you're not specifically targeting people in wheelchairs as your target group. Just try and make that a default. Have gender neutral bathrooms, because why wouldn't you? A little nice touch, by the way, an easy way to spoil your community or your event participants. Here's a little hint. Um, <laughs> No, is uh, to have little baskets in the bathrooms with um, small toiletries such as dental floss and tampons, maybe deodorant. When you do that at when you do that at bigger events, people always appreciate little goodies. Designate an area for people to retreat, like a quiet area where there is no photographing and no talking. Especially if you're doing a longer event that's like multiple days, that's really necessary for people. Not everyone like is like a social, like that much of a social animal that they want to talk all the time. Sometimes they just want to retreat, have a little bit of a relaxation time, little time out. That's really helpful. If you don't have a lot of space, this can be as little as a sofa in the back or maybe the terrace or the outsides as a designated area for people to just chill. Again, talking about bigger events and conferences, consider offering childcare as a service for your participants. And maybe um, offer or designate a room for kids to play in and or to nurse babies in. Even if not a lot of people take you up on that offer at first, the fact that you've got those things there are a statement of value. People will know, okay, you've got those things there, you've got those options there. This might be something in the future. It often takes a while for those measures to take effect. Okay. We are now venturing into strictly non-material culture territory. The ideas, beliefs, values and norms that shape a society, like language and behavior. And as I mentioned before, archaeology really has a hard time dealing with those. That's not really anything that you can grasp with material culture. It's only to be approximated. But these things are important points for creating a welcoming and diverse community. So I'm going to share a few of those things with you as well today, because archaeology did teach me, though, how important it is to work across disciplines. If you don't have one already, get yourself a friendly space policy or a code of conduct or event guidelines, however you want to call it. And use it for your events and maybe also for your online spaces if you've got a lot of online, online spaces in your community going. A friendly space policy or code of conduct is basically writing down the rules of being nice to each other and respecting your participants' rights to privacy, self-determination, and explicitly prohibiting unwanted physical contact, contact, for example, or sexist language, sexist imagery, racist, comic, racist comments, xenophobic comic, comments, or comics, whatever, otherwise degrading, degrading interactions. This really makes the biggest difference. I have experience from where we from events that we held where we didn't have a friendly space policy in place and then from events where we did have that in place and read it at the start of the event and we got really positive feedback. It, it doesn't save you from problems ever occurring and just because you don't have a friendly space policy doesn't mean that your events 
like bound to have a lot of incidents. But what a friendly space policy does, it, it shows that you actively care about creating a safe and like nice and friendly environment. And it puts in place an official structure for you to deal with potential misconducts, which is actually quite a good thing for you to have as organizers, so that you know what you would do in such a case, that you can also mentally prepare for such an event. And it therefore, because of this official structure, it lowers the threshold for people to speak up when they actually experience something unpleasant. And if you get that feedback from your participants, like, don't be disheartened. That's, like, any feedback from your community is good. That always, that can always make you better. And it doesn't mean that you had a, like, a bad event or that you are bad organizers. Just take that feedback seriously and see what you can do the next time. Okay. If you're looking for a way to onboard newcomers, you might want to consider running a mentoring program where newcomers are partnered up with more experienced members of your community, which are their mentors, who are specifically there to teach them and to support them in their first steps. If you want some inspiration for that, we did run a, or design and run, a mentoring program for the Wikimedia Hackathon last year for which my team was lucky enough to win the Diversity Award at the Open Minds Award Austria. So I'll tweet that as well. And finally, we get to the tasty part. Allow enough time for socializing. Like the party, I did really like the party announcement. Regardless of the shoes, parties are important. The socializing part, I really liked it about this conference, that there were a lots, of, a lots of opportunities, lots of breaks to talk to each other, because that's actually what a community is all about, the social interactions. Some tips are, like when you organize a small meetup, maybe make it optional to go for dinner together, or when you host a workshop, make the first 30 minutes around registration, like really designate them as getting to know each other time. And when you do go out to party, make sure that as is the case with like typical, can be the case with like especially typical Austrian culture, that it's not just about getting drunk with each other, but that it's actually like a nice social experience and always make alcohol a plus, but never a default. Socializing is traditionally done very well over food, of which there was a lot of excellent uh, quality here today, and also a great range and variety in food, because that's also, that's also a really cool thing to offer different options, cater to different tastes, have healthy snacks, as well as something to indulge in. Yes. What do we have? Well. In the end, the social part is what makes or breaks your community. The technology and the content might be the hook, but whether a participant fa finds the actual social interactions that she had at your event or community, whether she finds that pleasant or not, will determine whether she makes her way back to your community. And be patient. As I said, those methods that you so carefully put in place might not work for the first time. And when you work like towards bringing newcomers to your event and you work really hard, you, you invest a lot of hours in, in a lot of, lot of human power and they don't come back, that can be disheartening. But give it time and really integrate those methods into your community structure and your efforts will likely pay off in the long run. So I hope that my talk today inspired you to look at the world from a few different angles. And I mean, if I can like, take something from archaeology and build a bridge to working in tech communities, I'm sure you all have lots of different backgrounds and different skills that you can put, put to good use too. If you've got any follow-up questions, please tweet at me, at Sonkiki, I'm going to mention it again. You can also email me, mail at soniafischbauer.com. I really look forward to hearing from you or talking to you later at the mentioned after party. That's going to be nice. And um, yeah, well, thanks a lot for your attention. Have a good night. <laughs>
Mm-hmm.